Halloween season was in full swing on Sodor, which brought about one of the engine's favourite traditions, ghost stories. And every year, on the date of the accident, it plunges into the gap shrieking like a blah, blah, blah. We've all heard this story before. Get some new material, Percy. Look, Thomas, it's not exactly easy to come up with a good ghost story that won't get laughed away before it's even finished. I'd like to see what you can come up with. Well, I, uh, since you insisted on telling one tonight, I wouldn't want to deprive you of the honour. Besides, my story would just, uh, scare you too much. Oh, is that so? Very much so. Wouldn't want to traumatise you or anything. Go on then, tell it. Don't worry about me. I can handle- I've got one. You? You've got a good ghost story. Well, good is subjective, but I don't doubt it'll be interesting at the very least. Well then, you've got my attention. <laughs> I give it five minutes before we've been bored into wanting my story again. Shush, I want to hear this. Take it away, Toby. Well, this story takes place many years ago, on a railway far, far away from ours. There was a large diesel engine who worked on a small branch that served a harbour and a scrapyard. No one can remember the diesel's actual name, however at some point people began calling him Diesel 10. He was, by all accounts, a kind soul, who worked hard and was friendly to all his comrades, even the steam engines. He mainly worked at the scrapyard, pulling trucks to and fro as needed. Though his performance was by no means lacking, the manager of the scrapyard had an idea for a modification that would make Diesel 10 even more efficient. A modification that was both legally and morally questionable. One morning, the men showed up for work as usual, and were surprised to find that Diesel 10 had been outfitted with a large mechanical claw. It was the manager's own design, an experimental one, made for loading and unloading scrap, as well as clearing obstacles from the line as needed. The claw was certainly met with some controversy. Many people argued whether such a modification could or should be made. But what they'd failed to realise, however, was how the claw was affecting its engine. It's said that the claw changed Diesel 10. What do I mean by that, you may ask? Well, the kind, gentle, giant diesel everyone had come to love over the years began to fade away. And in its place, a new persona dawned, though this one not nearly as comforting. He became reclusive, angry and spiteful. He frequently lash out at the workmen, and the steam engines. Oh my, he could make even the toughest steam engines boiler run cold on the hottest of days. He'd hurl insults and threats at them, telling them how obsolete they were, and how diesels were destined to take over. He'd make the sick offer to be the one who personally tore the engines apart when their day to be scrapped came. He became an all-around menace people concluded that the claw must be what was corrupting him, and they began pressuring the scrapyard's manager to remove it once and for all. But he stood by his decision, claiming the claw worked like a charm, and made the work quicker. Over time, however, he would come to regret his decision. Late one night, a little engine had to make a late night delivery to the scrapyard. They were nervous. A trip to the scrapyard meant they'd surely encounter Diesel 10, right? Well, upon entering the yard, it seemed to the little engine that that wouldn't be the case, for the menacing Diesel was nowhere to be seen. It was a misty night though, which limited how far the little engine could see. They shunted their trucks into a siding, and were just about to leave when they suddenly heard a low rumble. They looked over and saw a massive claw coming straight for them. The next morning, the men arrived for work once again and were horrified by what they saw. There was Diesel 10 looking as evil as ever, 
staring coldly down at the remains of the little engine. He'd torn them down to pieces, and now all that remained were jagged shards of metal. Everyone was shocked and outraged. They all blamed the manager. You could have prevented it, they'd say. Realising he had no other choice, the manager scrapped Diesel 10 in disgrace. It wouldn't be enough to save his scrapyard though, for with all the negative publicity surrounding it, nobody wanted to do business there. The scrapyard was shut down not long after, and now with one of its two served industries closed, the branch followed closely behind. Diesel 10 was quickly forgotten about, and nowadays most consider him a legend over someone who really existed. However, some say that on a dark, misty night, Diesel 10 is still out roaming the rails, flying down the main line through the fog with his claw flailing like mad, creeping through the sidings, waiting at the back of the shed. He haunts the railways, looking for a steam engine who's a suitable next victim. And if you aren't careful, maybe it will be you. Wow, that was, that was actually really good. Like, really good. Yeah, good job, Toby. Where'd you hear that one at? Oh, I don't know. Probably a workman or station master some time ago. <laughs> nice. Too bad it's easily the most fake story I've ever heard, because it's actually pretty intriguing. Fake? What makes you say that? A huge diesel with a claw. Come on, do you actually have any idea how illegal that is? If someone actually tried that, they'd have so many legal issues on their hands, they'd be sorry they ever tried it. Interpret the story how you will, but you know how ghost stories tend to go. The non-believers are always the ones they go after first. <laughs> yeah, Percy, you'd better watch your bunker, otherwise you might end up with a claw poking into it. <laughs> yeah, whatever. The next day, Thomas found himself waiting at the platform for his passengers to board. Fog had rolled in from the sea, which with the context of the previous night's story seemed eerier than ever. As he waited, Thomas heard a low rumbling sound, and then Boko flew by with a goods train. Thomas jumped back, startled. Then he heard chuckling coming from the yard adjacent. What's the matter, Thomas? You think Diesel 10's coming for you? I shouldn't be surprised. You are the engine with a tendency for being scared out of your frames. Let me in! Let me in! <laughs> Percy said mockingly as he puffed away, leaving Thomas feeling rather embarrassed. Percy was feeling quite pleased with himself. For the rest of the day, whenever he passed Thomas, Percy would taunt and laugh at him. Ooh, uh, look out for the ghost diesel, Thomas! Oh, I've damn near had it with Percy's arrogance. I'll bet you he wouldn't be so confident if he really saw that diesel. That's just how Percy is. I'd reckon you'd do the same to him if you were in his position. You've just got to put up with it for a day or so. He'll get tired of it soon enough. Thomas could only hope so. What neither of them realised though, was that they wouldn't have to wait as long as they'd thought. That night, Percy was set to take the post train. He'd simmered happily at the harbour, waiting for his vans to be loaded. It didn't take long, and soon he steamed out of the harbour. The run along the misty line went smoothly. He made his stops at Tidmouth and Crosby, and was now bound for Wellsworth. 
the viaduct loomed ahead and Percy felt the heavy winds pick up as he began to cross. Then, rather unexpectedly, Percy's brakes were slammed hard on, bringing him to a quick stop in the middle of the viaduct. Percy was confused. Driver, why have we stopped? He received no answer. In the distance, a clock tower struck ten. Percy felt nervous now. He began to feel the rails vibrating, and a low rumbling sound was heard in the distance. And then... following morning, Edward arrived with the breakdown train and the fat controller. Percy, are you alright? Percy didn't answer. He just sat there, a haunted look on his face. Percy, what happened here last night? I, I think he's in shock, sir. I think you're right, Edward. I'd like to know what from, though. Ugh. What happened here? Well, I was hoping you could answer that. I don't know. Oh, the last thing I remember was us starting to cross the viaduct. Next thing I know, I've just woken up in a bush with the fireman. Oh, my head feels all sorts of foggy. Like the worst hangover of my life. I second that. I feel awful, and I have no clue what's happened here. Hmm, I see. And what of the guard? The guard? He wasn't with us, I don't think. Maybe he's still in the... Oh my god! There, sitting where the brake van should have been, was a splintered pile of wood and metal. It was all that was left of it. What? what happened? Hmm. I don't know. And it seems the only one who can tell us that is unable to speak at the moment. <sighs> We'd better get this cleaned up. Edward, after the van's ruins have been dealt with, take Percy and his mail vans back to Tidmouth. Let him rest for a while. It looks as though he needs it. Yes, sir. Edward left Percy in the branch line sheds, and then quietly puffed away to let him rest. As Percy sat there in the shed, he found himself lost in his own thoughts. He couldn't process what had happened to him. He wasn't even sure whether he was dreaming or not. His grip on reality was hazy, and all he could do for now was hope that, in time, he'd find a way to make sense of it all. So let this be a lesson to all of you. Never take the subject of the supernatural lightly. Otherwise, there's no telling what could happen. Fall had come, and the engines of the little railway were working hard. Leaves fell from the trees and coated the tracks, and it was up to the engines to clear them. Late one night, Peter Sam was out with one of these trains. It wasn't unusual for a maintenance train to be running at this time. It gave the crew the ease of not having to work around other trains. Peter Sam was the only engine running and enjoyed the solidarity. He hummed a tune as he puffed down the deserted line, basking in the cool night breeze.
As he made his way onto the open cliffside, the wind suddenly picked up. It shrieked as it blew round his funnel, making him shiver. Then, through the darkness, he noticed a figure standing next to the tracks. What's that man doing up there? He'll fall if he isn't careful. He focused his attention back onto the figure to call out to them, only to find them gone. Driver! Driver, stop! Someone's fallen off the cliff! Peter Sam's driver applied the brakes and brought the train to a stop. He stepped from the cab and stared into the darkness of the ravine below where he could see there was no one at the bottom of the cliff. Confused, he explained the situation to Peter Sam, climbed back into the cab, and then continued onward. When Peter Sam arrived back at the shed, he found the others fast asleep. Still rather overwhelmed from earlier, he gave a blast of his whistle to wake them. Gah, I say, what was that? That'd be Peter Sam blasting his whistle in the dead of the night and waking me up? What gives? Uh, uh, whatever this is, it'd better be damn urgent. Oh, um, yes, uh... Uh, sorry to wake you all. I, I was just, uh, well, uh, hoping you could help me understand what happened tonight. <sighs> well, that depends on what happened now, Peter Sam. <sighs> Peter Sam quickly explained what happened. And when my driver looked for him, he was just, well, gone. Uh, nowhere to be found. A disappearing man? This is what you woke me at a ridiculous hour for. I've half a nerve to- That's quite enough, Duncan. Everyone looked over to Scar Lowy. It was unusual for the number one to snap like that, which meant whatever he had to say was of the utmost importance. I didn't want to have to revisit this memory. It's quite unpleasant. Uh, but I'd hardly say I have a choice now. Many years ago, in the earliest days of the railway, I was taking a late-night passenger train. Aboard my train, among others, was a man, the identity of which no one knows. The passengers that night said he looked very withdrawn and unhappy. They didn't think anything of it. Uh, perhaps he just had a bad day, hmm? Well, whether or not that was the case, or there was something more, we'll never know. For as we were rounding the cliff face, without warning, the man leaped from the carriage and threw himself over the side of the cliff, plummeting to his death. Whether by accident or intentional, no one could deny it was a tragedy. But time never stops for anyone, and the railway moved on. To this day, it remains a mystery why the cliff jumper did what he did. But the local legend says that every year, around the anniversary of his death, he can be seen standing beside the track, briefly, before once more vanishing into the night. The engine said nothing as Scarloe finished his story. They just stared at him, feeling scared and intrigued. Finally, Duncan broke the silence. Pah! What a load of rubbish! For God's sake, Duncan, show some respect! A man's life was lost! And that's tragic, yeah, but the idea of his ghost lurking a rune, I mean, come on! He wanted out of this world, right? What sense would it make for him to stick around here then, eh? You haven't the slightest clue what the circumstances truly are, Duncan. There are things in this world we just can't understand, so I'd suggest you leave well enough alone. Huh. <laughs> At any rate, thanks for the story, Scarlowy. Definitely wasn't worth this green imbecile waking me up for, eh, but it was all right enough, I suppose. Now, respectfully, shut up and let me sleep. 
The others were shocked at Duncan's callousness, especially Peter Sam, who still felt very uncomfortable. Scarloe, meanwhile, was silently hoping that Duncan would see sense before it was too late. Next day saw the little engines once again working hard. Duncan was to spend his day pulling slate to and from the quarry. All was going well, but Scarloe's story was still fresh in his mind. Despite his confidence the night before, Duncan had been deeply moved by the story. He quivered as the fierce wind whipped around the cliffside, sending shivers through his boiler. Easy boy, called his driver. There's no need to ride roughly. I'm no riding roughly, just a wee bit cold is all. But that wasn't all, and Duncan knew it. The mist had come down and made it difficult to see. As Duncan entered the quarry, he suddenly saw the shape of a man standing beside the line. Startled, Duncan shot forward and right off the rails. Blimey, you all right? It had only been a workman. Duncan now felt very foolish indeed. It was getting late by the time the workman had re-railed Duncan. He still had a slate run to make, so he quietly waited for his trucks to be loaded and then backed onto them and set off. The wind howled as Duncan neared the cliffs. Just a wee tail, just a wee tail, Duncan told himself. Then, as Duncan rounded a bend, he saw him, the shadowy outline of a man illuminated by the faint moonlight. He looked sadly at Duncan, who was trembling too badly to move. The man stared for what felt like an eternity. Then, with a tear rolling down his cheek, he said something that made Duncan's heart stop. I... I loved him. And then the man turned and leaped off the side of the cliff. Duncan was horrified. G -g 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 Duncan. Duncan? Is everything all right up there? G -g 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 ghost! It's the ghost! Ghost? What ghost? The man. He was there. He. He. He jumped. He. What man? Duncan, there hasn't been anyone there. I... I think you need some rest. Uh, perhaps you hit your head when you crashed earlier. Come on now, let's get you home. And Duncan set off again, wondering whether he'd really seen the man or if his mind had simply played a nasty trick on him. But we know, don't we? Winter is cruel to an island surrounded by the sea, and the mid Sodor Railway was experiencing this firsthand. The cold winds blew fiercely, and the snow fell heavy, coating the line and everything surrounding it. The engines found work difficult, and one morning they were complaining about it in the shed. Ah, man, this snow ain't fun. We had it back in the States, but not like this. Can't get anything done with this stuff around. Really? Hmm. Yeah, I hadn't noticed any change in your productivity rate, Stanley. Ah, shut up, Grandpa. Well, I actually don't mind the snow all that much. Really? Why on God's earth not? Well, I think it's quite beautiful, frankly. Yeah, it makes work go a bit slower, but it's just so mesmerizing. It's almost magical. It is. Magical ain't the word I'd use. 
For once, I'm in agreement with Stanley. Snow is a bother, John, and if you let your guard down around it, it can land you in heaps of trouble. No amount of beauty will make up for a serious accident it causes. Eh, I'm careful enough with snow. I know how to handle it. I've never had an accident in it, and I don't plan on starting any time soon. <laughs> Easy for you to say. Why, just last week the snow caused me to derail outside the quarry. Last week? Huh. Odd, I don't recall there being snow last week. Uh, well, I, uh... Yeah, Regardless, yeah. you'd best be extra careful, John. Be mindful of the danger. Sure thing, Grandpuff. A few days later, the snow was still falling. John had just returned home with his final train of the day, and was now resting in the shed, when he noticed the manager trudging through the thick snow towards him. John, the incline at the quarry has broken. I need you to take a train of supplies there now so the men can have it repaired by morning. Oh, uh, alright then, sir. Duke, who was in the shed nearby, eyed John worriedly. You'd best be careful out there. You'll be traveling back at night, and the snow showing no sign of stopping. Yes, Grandpuff, I know. Don't worry, a little snow never hurt anyone. But John couldn't have been more wrong. The journey up went fine enough, and John made his delivery right on schedule. The trip back, however, wasn't as smooth. The snow pelted down, and John could hardly see. Worse still, the heavy drifts were beginning to become too much for the little engine, and soon, he and his crew had to accept that they could go no further. They stopped at a station, where they weighed their options. Hmm, we can't just leave you out on the main line, it's not safe there. Well, what about that siding there? Are you sure about that? That'll leave you with no cover all night. Yeah, I'll be fine. I've endured worse than this. So John's crew parked him in the siding, and then left to walk to a nearby inn. At first, it wasn't so bad, but the heat from John's boiler quickly died out, leaving nothing to melt the snow piling up around him. Uh, oh well, it's j j just for the night. I'm sure everything will be alright. It's just a little snow. <sighs> The next morning, Duke arrived at the station with a team of workmen to dig out John, who was now buried deep within a bank of snow and ice. Well, would you look at that. I wonder if that engine's opinion on snow has changed since we last spoke. <laughs> Hang in there, John. We'll have you out soon. If you can even hear me under there. The men walked over to where the little engine sat buried. The first workman strode up to the bank, about to take the first swing of his shovel, when suddenly there was a mighty gust of wind. It blew the snow every which way, blinding Duke and the men. And then it began to settle. Oh. My. Lord. What? What happened? John was gone, having seemingly vanished under that snow pile. But, but surely they found him. Do you remember seeing John when you worked there? N no Exactly. Now, see to it you're extra careful out in the snow. Otherwise, well, need I say more? No, yeah, no, no, I'm that's, not that's, right, I don't, really. I, I don't no, need to hear anymore. We'll, we'll I, be I think I get the idea, yes. I, I'll be careful, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was quite a story, Duke. Did, did that really happen? Heavens no. They found John frozen to his frames under that snowbank. He was real quiet about snow after that. He was sold off to a privately owned mining company before Sir Handel and Peter Sam arrived. 
You have to admit, though, it's a pretty good story. Indeed. Why, that may even stop them complaining when we tell them to be careful in the snow. <laughs> Especially Duncan, after that business with the cliff jumper. Yep. Nothing a good story can't fix. Though, I must admit, I'm beginning to run low on spooky tales. Well, I heard one from this diesel not too long ago, and from what I can tell, it may have actually happened. Would you like to hear it? Hmm. Sure. Dennis is a shunting diesel who works on the various yards on the Fat Controller's railway. He's a more than capable worker, when he wants to be, which isn't all that often. To put it nicely, his work ethic has some room for improvement. But if you were to ask some of the other engines, they wouldn't put it quite as politely. Dennis is constantly doing whatever he can to get out of his work. If you can think of an excuse, he's probably tried it. Because of his laziness, Dennis isn't very well liked by his co-workers, though the way he acts, he doesn't seem to care. One morning, the fat controller came to visit Dennis in his shed. The scrapyard at Barrow is quite backed up at the moment, and they are in need of an extra shunter. I've volunteered you for the job. You'll be working there for the next few days. Dennis was horrified. But, sir, I don't want to go there. Why can't you send someone else? The decision is final. You'll leave for battle within the next hour, and while you are there, I expect you to be on your best behavior. Should I receive reports of you being, um, unproductive, you will be one sorry engine. Do I make myself clear? Yes, sir, Dennis said dryly. That afternoon, Dennis arrived at the scrapyard. He found the foreman waiting for him there. Now then, you're Dennis, I presume? That's, uh, me, yes. Right then, a train of scrap just came in. I want you to collect the trucks and organize them in the sidings. But, but sir, uh, I just had a draining journey. Can't I have a bit of a rest first? No time for that, I'm afraid. Get your work done quickly, and you'll be able to rest before you know it. Now, come on, chop chop, get to work. And the foreman walked away. Reluctantly, Dennis rolled away to begin his work. Dennis hadn't heeded the fat controller's advice. His work ethic was pitiful, and he dragged his wheels as he shunted the trucks about the yard. It didn't take long before he'd slipped into his usual habits. Oh, I feel painfully ill. I think I feel my radiator. It pains me to say this, but I don't think I can go on working. The foreman wasn't buying it, but Dennis was making such a fuss, he didn't want to waste any more time arguing with him. Right then, I'll have the workmen come take a look at you. When, <clears throat> if they find nothing is wrong, I expect you to be back to work straight away. Yes... Yes, sir. The men examined Dennis all over, and as the foreman expected, they found nothing. Oh, but I can still feel the pain. Can't you look again? Surely you've missed something. No, we haven't. We've wasted enough time here, now get back to work. You don't want to see the foreman when he's angry. <laughs> Some workplace environment this is. Making sick engines work when they're in pain, Dennis said indignantly as he rolled away. Over the next few days, Dennis continued trying to find ways out of doing his work. Oh, my axle box has run hot. My engine is overheated. I think I've taken on some bad fuel. Eventually, the foreman reached his breaking point. Fine! If you don't want to work, then you'll sit at the back of the shed until you're sent home first thing tomorrow morning! To Dennis, that wasn't the cruel punishment the foreman thought it was. Finally, a chance to have a well-deserved res, he thought to himself. Dennis found a shed at the far side of the yard, 
when no one was around to bother him. Oh, now this is perfect, he muttered as he backed down into it. It didn't take long for the lazy diesel to drift off to sleep. But when Dennis awoke, it was dark. He hadn't a clue what time it was, nor what had awoken him. It didn't take long to figure out the latter, though. It was the humming of a diesel engine, a humming which belonged to a little orange shunter backing down into the shed next to him. The engine looked exactly like Dennis. The shed taken? Well, I guess it is now, Dennis said grumpily. He'd been enjoying the solidarity. The diesel took no notice of Dennis's poor attitude. He just stared at him intently. And what are you doing here all by yourself then? Why is that any of your concern? The diesel's smile vanished. I'll tell you why you're here. It's because you're a lazy, useless engine. Dennis was taken aback. Excuse me! Who do you think you are? I can't help being sick sometimes. Sick? Sick! Why, you miserable engine, as someone who's actually prone to breaking down, you disgust me. I shut it! Did you know that I'm a faulty build? I can hardly work some days, but I still give it my all, because unlike you, who has a controller that cares for you and would get you the repairs you need, my controller cares nothing for me. If he doesn't see me as efficient, poof, I'm gone just like that. I literally have to work through excruciating pain every day in order to stay alive and to see a spoiled sort like you lie about something like that to get out of work. I don't even know what to say. Do you have any idea how lucky you are? There are so many engines waiting in the cold, dark sidings of scrapyards, such as this very one who would give anything to be in your position, yet you couldn't care less. Your pathetic. Well, 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 what do you know? Who are you anyway? Consider me your wake-up call. It's not too late to change. You could put your past behind you and become a hard-working engine who's a credit to your railway. Oh, yeah? And just why would I do that? Because you've been gifted a very fortunate home. One which you're ungrateful for. Don't you think your controller and fellow engines deserve a little bit of respect, at the very least? <laughs> They'll get my respect when I feel like giving it to them. I'm tired of listening to your insufferable rant. I've got a long journey in the morning, and I'd like to rest up before I leave. Good night, uh, you. And Dennis closed his eyes, and was soon, once again, fast asleep having all but dismissed the Diesel's words. The next morning, Dennis awoke bright and early. The Diesel from the night before had gone, and Dennis was all alone in the shed. Soon, his driver arrived, and he drove Dennis over to the fuel pump to top off before the journey back to Sodor. As he was taking on fuel, one of the yard shunters rolled up next to him, awaiting their turn to use the pump. Oh, so you're bound for home today? Indeed. Not a moment too soon, eh? Um, no offense. I take it you didn't enjoy your stay then? Not really, no. And, uh, oh, uh, what's that Orange Diesel's name? Orange Diesel? Yeah, it looks exactly like me, but, uh, you know, Orange. Huh? Oh, Norman! <laughs> that old hunk of junk was sold off a scrap months ago. I'm... I'm sorry? Yeah, he was a poor runner from the start. He finally gave out almost a year ago now. Foreman sold him off to be scrapped. If you ask me, I think he should have done it long before. Did you know him? I am... Um, I, I guess... Just then, Dennis's driver called out. Tanks full, old boy. We'd best get going. Oh, 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 uh, yes, yes, of course. And Dennis rolled quickly away. Mm -hmm. 
Dennis is a changed engine now. His encounter with what he can only assume was his brother left a deep impact on him. These days, Dennis is a hard worker. He mainly keeps to himself, and though he sometimes feels the urge to find an excuse to stop and rest, he refuses to let himself slip back into old habits, for he now knows just how lucky he is. Dennis still thinks about Norman from time to time. He hadn't even known he had a brother. And even though they only met once, Dennis can't help but feel remorse for his late brother. Some nights, Dennis swears he can feel Norman's presence, but he can never say for sure. During the summer months, the Duke and Duchess of Boxford like to visit the Fat Controller's Railway. They stay in a summer house on a large private estate, complete with a loop of track and a shed for Spencer. It's a beautiful and picturesque location in the summer months, secluded in the woods with animals frolicking freely in the sunshine. For the rest of the year, however, the loop sits untouched and unused. The engines have no reason to venture down it, for with no one staying there, the line serves no purpose, and so the large mansion and the track sit quietly, waiting for the summer months when they'll see use again. One year, however, the line was to be travelled upon in the off months. It was a cool autumn evening. And Neville the bullied Q1 had just retired to his shed for the evening when he saw the Fat Controller's car enter the yard. He parked it and walked over to Neville's shed. Good evening, sir. What brings you here at this time of night? I have an important job for you, Neville. The Duke and Duchess of Boxford spoke to me, telling me that the track at Boxford Loop felt a bit rough this summer. As far as I can tell, the line hasn't seen much maintenance since... Well before I took over as controller. <laughs> Needless to say, that needs to be attended to, and I've decided to put you in charge of the track maintenance. Neville was surprised. Me, sir? Are you sure? That seems like a big responsibility. Indeed it is, and I have good faith that you'll do a fine job with it. You start next week, so take some time to prepare yourself. We must make sure that the Boxford Loop is in tip-top shape. Yes, sir, Neville replied excitedly. The Fat Controller gave a nod, then got into his car and drove away. The weeks passed, and before Neville knew it, he found himself on his first day of his new job. He collected his train of workmen and supplies early that morning and set off for Boxford Loop. The sunny sky had become dreary and cloudy by the time Neville reached the loop's junction. A low mist had begun to settle, and it gave the line a very ominous look. The driver threw the points, and Neville slowly set off down the line. The tracks felt old and rough, though Neville hardly paid attention to that. The mist made the secluded area seem even more liminal, and truth be told, it was putting him on edge. Wheel turn by wheel turn, he made his way down the branch. Presently, Neville saw the outline of a large structure cutting through the mist. It was the summer house, which didn't look nearly as inviting as Neville had pictured. It stood tall and still high up on a hill uninhabited by anyone. He wondered to himself whether the Duke and Duchess would ever step foot in it again if they were to see it like this. Neville had soon puffed past the mansion, and it disappeared back into the fog just as quickly as it had appeared. He trudged on down the line and around the rest of the loop, struggling to keep his nerves in check.
Neville completed his circle around the loop. The men had taken a note of any spot where the track needed tending to, and Neville spent the rest of the day pushing his trucks to and fro, stopping to let the men work where they were marked. All went to plan, and as night broke, the men were packing up the last of their tools and preparing to head home. Just as they were about to leave, there suddenly came an ear-piercing scream, followed by the sound of panicked footsteps charging through the forest all around them. The only light source came from Neville's headlamp, which was barely bright enough to illuminate even the outermost edge of the woods. The footsteps continued. Neville and the men were horrified. Get us out of here! called a workman. Snapping out of it, Neville's driver threw open the regulator and the train shot backwards. As they gunned it out of there, Neville could have sworn he saw a shadowy figure standing on the tracks, watching him puff away. The next morning, Neville awoke to find the fat controller standing outside his shed, with a stern expression on his face. Due to unforeseen circumstances, he began, there will be no maintenance trains to take down Boxford Loop today. Neville was surprised, but not all that disappointed. Um, might I ask why, sir? Does it have anything to do with the footsteps we heard last night? No, the fat controller replied sharply. A couple of hooligans trespassing on private property is hardly grounds to delay such an important operation. Rest assured, the police have been informed of last night's events, and are looking into it. The actual reason is that nearly three quarters of the workmen from yesterday are refusing to go back today. I was unable to come up with a replacement team on such short notice, however, I should have one assembled by tomorrow. Never wasn't all that surprised he'd considered protesting himself. I will see to it, the fat controller continued, that those men are punished. I do not tolerate insubordination on my railway. You're to help with the good traffic on the main line for today. If all goes according to plan, you'll leave with another maintenance train first thing tomorrow. Is that understood? Yes, sir, Neville replied feebly, though secretly. He hoped things wouldn't go according to plan. Neville spent his day pulling goods trains back and forth around the island. Word of the previous night's events had already begun to spread around the railway. Heard you got run out of the woods by some drunk kids last night, Neville, James teased. Oh, the horrors. If you hadn't run out of there in time, maybe they'd have subjected you to the horrors of partying with them. <laughs> That's not funny. I don't know what was out there last night, but it wasn't just a couple of juveniles having a good time. I can tell you that much. Well, whatever it was, I'd take care in future. Who knows? Maybe next time they'll start dancing too. Ha ha ha. Everyone Neville saw wanted to know all about his encounter. Though, none more so than Edward. He was hoping to see Neville as soon as he could. However, things wouldn't work out for this to happen. At the end of the day, Neville backed down into his shed, not much looking forward to what tomorrow had in store. Surprisingly, the next few days went by rather uneventfully. Neville and the men made good progress and nothing strange happened. Neville was beginning to wonder if the events of the first night did have a rational explanation after all. One evening, Neville had stopped as usual to let the men work when the guard walked up to him. I've just received a call from a plane, he told him. There was a mix-up at the yard this morning. A van needed for Henry's fish train was shunted onto your train by mistake. You need to return it to the yard so it can be loaded in time for the kipper tonight. Leave the men and the tools here. It'll take them a few hours to patch up this pit of track. So, they should be getting ready to leave when you return. Uh, will do, Neville replied and he set off up the line to bring Henry his van. He arrived at the harbour by dusk and shunted the van over to where Henry was waiting. Sorry about the confusion, I came as soon as I heard, Neville said. Henry was about to reply, before suddenly fixing his gaze upon the van. Neville, what happened to the van? Neville looked over and gasped. There, on the side of the van, was a large pole. It looked fresh. 
I, I... I don't know. It wasn't like that when I left, or at least... Well, at least I don't think it was. It looks like someone broke it open with something heavy, like... Like a hammer? An axe, maybe? Well, maybe one of the men had an accident with some tools? No, but surely I would have noticed that. I... Oh, I don't know. I'll ask about it when I get back. Again, I'm really sorry about the van, Henry. Neville finished, and he steamed away to collect the men, his curiosity now intrigued. It was dark when Neville returned to collect the men. The moon was full and shined the faintest of light onto the summer house. The men had put their tools away and were waiting in the coach. Neville buffered up to the train and was just about to puff away when suddenly... Another ear-piercing scream, exactly like the one from the first night, suddenly rang out through the darkness. Neville's eyes darted around, looking for the source. In the faint light from the moon, he could just make out the shape of several figures charging through the forest, seemingly running away from the mansion. Neville was petrified and couldn't find his voice to call out to them. And then he noticed another figure walking through the darkness. It was making its way towards him and appeared to be holding something. The figure walked onto the track and stopped. It was a man dressed in old fashioned clothes, wielding a large axe. He stared blankly at Neville for what felt like an eternity. Then he turned on his heel and ran off into the darkness. Neville suddenly became aware of his crew Neville? calling out to him. Neville, you're right, mate. You hearing us? Uh, yeah, I'm alright. We're good. Let's get out of here. And so they did. Neville pumped his pistons and raced backwards out of the forest as fast as he could. Work on the line's restoration was put on hold, and Neville resumed his work as a goods engine. The engines laughed at first. But they soon stopped when they realised whatever he'd experienced had taken a toll on Neville, who barely said a word. A few weeks passed, and one morning Neville awoke to find Edward and the Fat Controller waiting outside his shed. Morning, Neville. I hear things have been rough for you since you began working at Boxford Loop. Sure, I've brought Edward here, who says you can clear up some things for you. Check it away, Edward. The Fat Controller said, before he and Neville both turned their attention to Edward. Boxford Loop wasn't always owned by the Boxfords. In the early days of the railway, it was a mansion owned by a wealthy businessman and his wife. They had themselves a car, of course, forgetting where they needed to go, however they found it difficult to host large gatherings and parties, with the mansion being so secluded. So... They commissioned a privately owned railway line to run to their mansion and around the estate. They would then charter out trains for guests or supplies to be brought to them. That would be pulled by one of the Northwestern engines. One night, I was given a charter train of guests to be taken to the mansion for a party. I didn't get to travel there much, so I was happy to get the chance. I always liked the little scenic line. I dropped the passengers off and returned home to my shed for the night. I awoke the next morning to find the police waiting to get a statement from me. It turned out that the previous night a deranged man had snuck into the house with an axe where he began attacking the party guests. In the commotion, many of the guests ran for their lives into the surrounding woods, where they were then hunted down and killed by the Axeman, before he would take his own life later that night. The tragedy left the owners of the house dead, and so the mansion sat unoccupied for many years until the Duke and Duchess of Boxford found it, whilst looking for a summer house decades later. Now, by then, the history of the estate was all but forgotten about the public, so I imagine it's likely the Boxfords have no idea of the horrors that occurred on the property all those years ago. 
Wait, so Edward, so, so you're saying I, you're saying I saw ghosts? I, I, I cannot be certain, Neville. But the incident did occur around this time of year, and those poor souls' lives were taken from them before they knew what was happening. I believe that you bore witness to the lost spirits of the guests, being forced to relive the horrific night that cost them their lives. But that's just what I believe, Neville. You can draw your own conclusions, but I think... Neville said nothing, for he was lost in thought. The Fat Controller ultimately decided not to go through with repairing the track. He told the Boxfords the history of their estate and told them if they wished to get the line restored, they'd have to come up with the means to do so themselves. Now aware of its history, the Duke and Duchess decided they wanted nothing to do with the summer house and sold it off. With the story now widely known by the public again, no one wanted it. And so it was left to sit alone and abandoned. Neville eventually made peace with his trauma, though from time to time, he dreams of his experiences at Boxwood Loop. He can only hope that the line will remain untouched for the rest of time.